ValveTime.net. Hi, and welcome to a special Halloween episode of Valve Time Database, a show where we delve deep into a little-known topic or game for the sake of trying to learn as much as possible. A few of our episodes have exclusively looked at lost game projects, but we're returning to the real meat and potatoes of the series for this episode. Since it's Halloween, we typically home in on some kind of spooky or seemingly terrifying topic from one of Valve's games, but we'll be honest and say we couldn't really think of anything really obvious to talk about this year, having used up topics like Ravenholm and the TF2 Halloween events from years gone by. That is, until we decided to resurrect one of our oldest planned ideas, to analyze and study the Combine Synths, who, like the Stalkers were covered in earlier episodes, actually stand as one of the most horrific subjects in all of Valve's titles to date. If you don't know why the synths are particularly horrifying, for whatever reason, stay tuned and we'll fill you in. It's worth noting that we'll only be focusing on combine synths present in released games for the duration of both episodes of this database two-parter, as things could get a little hectic if we start to include all the cut enemies. Now, let's get started. First and foremost, what exactly is a synth? Well, the name for synths is likely derived from the term synthetic, implying that the creatures which fall under this header feature artificial and non-organic material used to enhance and override their natural abilities for the purposes of developing technology specifically for war. While the details for what exactly is added to combine synths is never made perfectly clear, it's obvious the most dramatic additions include armor, powerful weaponry, tools to enhance mobility, and possibly even life support systems designed to limit the aging process potentially indefinitely. These cyborg creatures are likely created forcibly and against the wills of the participating creatures, which have already been enslaved or captured as part of the combine's universe-spanning conquest. Their transformations are almost always brutal and unforgiving, stripping away the appearance and behavior of the affected creatures for the benefit of the military machine. Some synth designs are far more complex than others, but all of them are extremely intriguing in their own right, which explains why we are about to spend a decent amount of time analyzing and dissecting each in far more detail than any sane person ever should. Since it's Halloween, let's start off with by far the most obviously horrific and terrifying of all the synths, but mostly because it hits closest to home. We're of course talking about the human combine, referred to as transhuman by Wallace Breen. Human synths are by far the most diverse and numerous creatures seen throughout the Half-Life 2 saga, with multiple different types and varieties patrolling or guarding almost all combine-controlled areas of City 17 and the surrounding areas. Although the likes of the soldiers and shotgunners vary in terms of appearance, combine experience, and rank, it is believed their internal modifications are extremely similar, with their only other distinguishing factors including color schemes, insignias, and roles within the military. From what is known of the soldiers, their introduction to the military is likely a long and painful process of mental and physical augmentation and dissection, as tissue, internal organs, and even bone are seemingly removed and replaced with mechanical components such as piping, life support systems, and countless other technologies. The physical transformation while never shown directly in the series is hinted at in Nova Prospect and the Citadel where soldiers lacking their full armor can be seen sporting holes or stitches in their heads, necks, chest, and sides with an entirely metal exoskeleton seemingly fused to the lower half of their bodies. Given that the Combine require loyal soldiers who don't question morally bankrupt orders, their mental transformations are just as severe, with the Citadel housing countless devices specifically designed for the purposes of wiping the minds of soldiers-to-be before likely implanting military tactics, knowledge, and experience as a direct replacement for those lost memories. This explains how the soldiers can be so unbelievably cruel while still being able to communicate with each other and express pain, etc. While very similar, the varieties of soldiers seen in Half-Life 2 are quite different from that of the elites, who sport heavier armor and a very different, more distinctive helmet. It's not exactly known what is special about the elite helmet other than it looking cool, but it seems likely further augmentations have also been made to the head region to further improve the unit's abilities. Although it is never really hinted at in-game, the helmet's central singular eye makes it seem as if the eyes of the human inhabitant have been completely removed and replaced with a high-tech camera similar to that of the Strider, but this is purely speculation on our part. While we're discussing the Combine, it's worth noting that the Civil Protection Team seen throughout Half-Life 2 and Episode 1 are in fact not synths, and are simply willing participants following orders for the promise of better living conditions. Their lack of augmentations and brainwashing explains why they are only entrusted with the less advanced technology and tactics compared to the Combine soldiers. It also explains why they are shown to have broken off into their own independent faction at the end of Episode 1. This faction are briefly seen fighting against Gordon and the Rebels at the train station as a means of trying to capture the last few escape trains for themselves before the Rebels or Combine can use or destroy them. 
This betrayal obviously comes about as a result of the newfound impossibility for the Combine to keep their promise of a better living style and upgrades in the apocalyptic free-for-all that erupts in the final days of City 17. Now that we're done covering the most normal of the Combine synths, let's immediately jump to easily the most unusual, the Advisors. As by far the highest ranking creature and the least visibly robotic on this list, it's easy to assume that the advisors have very few augmentations compared to the military units they control, but that, as many of us know, is far from the truth. As the closest thing we have to the true form of the Combine, the advisors effectively stand as the template for all other synths that followed, appearing as a hyper-advanced race which have over-evolved to become nearly completely dependent on technology, likely having lost their original forms in the process. The most obvious augmentations present on the advisors include their long, slender metal claws, their breathing apparatus, their blue eye camera, and the tight brown sack they are contained within, all of which they require to survive on some level or another. While many of these devices have rather obvious uses, the sack is far more peculiar, featuring obvious stitching, a small control panel of some kind, and a pair of blue devices attached to the back. It's possible these sacks are intended to protect the advisors and to simply act as the combine equivalent of clothing, as we can't really identify any other obvious use for them. But again, this is pure speculation. The technological attachments are likely applied sometime shortly after whatever the combine equivalent of birth is, as shown by this plasticine figure of a juvenile advisor created by ex-Valve artist Ted Backman. While the juvenile advisor wasn't actually included in episode 2 at all, the creature's design was so far along that it seems likely the lore associated with it still applies to the canonical universe, meaning young advisors are more or less featureless with little more than a few stumpy appendages, a mouth and a tongue, and what is likely their equivalent of an anus, perfectly highlighting their reliance on the technology they have developed. Given the amount of technology that is literally stuffed into humans in the other synths, it is highly likely that the advisors themselves also have a vast amount of technology, cables, and piping littered throughout the insides of their bodies, much of which could assist with their life support, their telekinetic abilities, or potentially just the control and management of their external components. With the two most obvious synths out of the way, let's start talking about the core group of large synths in the Combine Arsenal, commonly known as the Strider, the Gunship, and the Dropship. Although very different, we've bundled all three of these synths into one group together as they're all extremely large creatures which feature similar insignia, armor plating, and color schemes. Starting with the most iconic of the three, the Strider stands as a 3-4 to four story tall tripod capable of leveling buildings, picking off opponents at long range, and maneuvering over virtually any kind of terrain. Striders are typically brought in as the Combine's guard dogs and demolition crews, protecting private zones during the early stages of Half-Life 2 and later destroying more or less the entire city in Episode 1. As one of the largest creatures in the Half-Life universe, the Strider is fairly difficult to analyze in standard gameplay, especially considering most of them explode upon death. While it's not clear if the Strider's height has been adjusted by the Combine, the creature's armor plating is most certainly an artificial attachment, with the brown, almost sand-colored hardened shell making Striders completely bulletproof to most normal weaponry. Starting with the head, the Strider's armor plating is split into three different components for maneuverability, with the middle section featuring a red version of the Combine's many insignia. In a famous scene from Episode 2, Dog is able to tear open the head of a Strider by peeling back this particular armor plate, revealing muscles, what is likely some kind of spine, and even the brain. As the interior of the head shows, the front of the Strider is actually relatively natural, with nothing artificial standing out at all. The large blue football or soccer ball sized brain also appears relatively untouched compared to that of humans, but it's quite possible that most of the internal changes were made in the rear of the head particularly since a clearly visible ventilation grate can be seen built into a slightly raised component, possibly hinting at unnatural additions hiding within. The other most notable features of the head include a long warp cannon used for heavy artillery and a much smaller pulse cannon used for picking off individual targets. It seems likely that the smaller of the two guns is also used by the Strider as some kind of eye, as shown by the way in which it twitches around sporadically as if constantly surveying its surroundings. Both of these guns appear as metal objects grafted into the Strider's flesh, with various cables also leading deeper into the head. The rest of the Strider's augmentations are relatively hard to spot or identify, although it's possible the legs and feet were given much tougher armor to match that of the head. As we mentioned earlier, the external appearance and design of the Striders is extremely similar to that of the Combine gunship, which frequently act as one of the Combine's strongest airborne forces alongside the definitely not a synth Hunter Chopper. Unlike the Strider, which is largely encapsulated in the armor shell, much of the gunship still appears relatively organic in nature, with eyes, veins, and muscles clearly still visible on the side and base of the crafts. Also unlike the Strider, the gunship appears to still feature all of their original eyes, with two pairs of large, fly-like eyes visible on the sides and front of the creature. 
As usual, these natural areas are vividly contrasted against the combine's mechanical components and weaponry, with a large belly cannon and a front pulse gun standing out as the most obvious evidence. One questionable area of the gunship's design is the manner in which it flies, as the smooth, extremely agile movement seen in the Half-Life 2 games would leave you to believe that the ability to fly is entirely artificial similar to that of a helicopter, but the thin, partially transparent propeller blades definitely disprove this idea. We think it's likely the gunship's flying capabilities are helped by whatever this kind of exhaust is at the front of the propeller, which appears far too straight and neat to be anything other than an artificial graft onto the body by the Combine. The trails of dirt on the fins and the exhaust also make them appear artificial as this is likely the remnants of some kind of unnatural chemical being expelled to improve the gunship's flight. Various other exhausts are also shown across the gunship's armored body, with one of the largest seemingly protruding from the main belly cannon, possibly to cool down the weapon after use. Despite the fact that the belly cannon has never actually been fired in a Half-Life game yet, and merely features as a carryover from earlier points in development. Speaking of pre-release content, the gunships were once set to be constructed in large, dry dock-like bays in the middle of the wasteland, something which was of course cut from the final release of Half-Life 2. Instead, seeing as the gunships enter the airspace around the Citadel through the Dark Fusion Reactor's portal, it's possible all of them are being built off-world before being flown in if and when necessary, with various repair work being conducted throughout the Citadel itself. As the third and main commonly seen synth, the dropship is by far the least aggressive, with the creature itself featuring no weaponry or offensive equipment of any kind. Dropships are one of the Combine's most relied upon supporting synths, coming in useful for delivering troops, vehicles, weapons, and even other synths to a battlefield while also being able to extract vital assets such as Gordon's buggy. They feature the same highly durable bulletproof armor as the Strider and Gunship, with other major external changes including various vents on the rear fins and a pair of metal wings fused into the front fins likely to assist with stability while flying and carrying additional weight. Like the Gunships, Dropships are also capable of flight, although it's not immediately clear if the Dropships flight is a natural ability or not as the four rear exhausts have been grafted onto the skin with clear stretching and scarring still visible as red marks. Two of the blue exhausts are attached to the back of six large arms, with the front two pairs being used seemingly as suction cups to carry any necessary equipment or personnel. It's possible these arms were in fact previously used as natural legs to allow the creature to walk, as we can't really identify any other obvious use for them. Again though, speculation. The dropship is typically heard far earlier than it is seen, as the unnatural telltale and now iconic noise of its clearly powerful exhaust can be heard from hundreds of meters away. Although the dropship features a large radiator-like grille on the front, it's not easy to identify whether this feature is artificial or not, as no other suitable locations for eyes are visible on the creature at all. While the dropships themselves haven't featured any offensive weaponry to date, the cargo they carry typically pulls double duty as also coming equipped with some kind of heavy pulse cannon. Given how the containers can be easily dropped or separated from the dropships, it's pretty unlikely the attached gun has anything to do with the synth creature itself and is more than likely fired by a combine operative inside the drop pod or at an external location. And stop right there as that'll bring us to the end of part one of our special Halloween look at the combine synths. Since this is part one, you can of course expect to see a part two released very soon, so be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to follow our social media pages to catch the next episode as soon as it's released. In our next episode, we'll be examining a bunch of the Combine's more unusual synth designs, including the likes of the Hunter, the Shield Scanner, and even a few rarely seen faces. Until then, thanks for watching, and bye for now.